on the first part we will begin now on the first part we are going to listen from ted penton from us and charles chilufia from africa who have compiled the responses from the conference on the question of what are network experiences what have we learned from those experiences these experiences are compiled so we got three questions already reflected by the conference on day 2 we had uh, uh, peter presenting us the first two questions and today is the third question sort of a compilation of the reflections the experiences that we have that we have compiled in the conference submitted but we have one global report now that's going to be for about 20 25 minutes then we will have the last panel of the congress a new way of proceeding in the social apostolate in terms of networking and collaboration it's over to ted for the presentation and charlie <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you so we're going to talk about what is and our interpretation of that which is rather than the ought uh, probably in the next uh, panel that's where there will be some concentration on what should be done what ought to be done and what could be improved um and this is from all the conferences um the US Latin America Africa uh Europe Asia South Asia so i'll show you first of all a video a short video So that's a video of um starlings birds migrating and you can see it's beautiful for some people eerie but it's really beautiful um and they are flying they're, those are thousands of birds but they are not colliding none of them are colliding and they fly the scientists say they fly in murmurations they give sounds yeah but what is more fascinating is that um those birds would not do so they wouldn't fly the way they are flying if they had to follow one leader there's no one leader and scientists believe that these birds are aligned on few simple rules that every bird makes autonomous decisions while flying in perfect synchrony so first and foremost they are in alignment and that alignment is what enables their autonomy and the autonomy makes them do what fly even faster and with great alacrity that is what we have seen in the reports on growing networks in the social sector in the sight of Jesus the reports we find them consoling and more and more we are networking we are acting autonomously but in very aligned ways there's still more work to be done it's true but there's already something beautiful that has emerged and still emerging social centers collaborating social centers with universities mission offices there's just something that is very consoling that is uh, emerging um next we see that this picture of birds illustrates the most important change that we are embracing in the social sector and in the site at large across conferences across provinces embracing new ways of working that are wrapping us around one purpose and yet leave ourselves autonomous to lead change make decisions and act in different places as i said the reports came from different places and they give this picture of different actions in different places by different people and yet there's some harmony um because there's a growing sense of working around one common purpose the why and a growing sense of working around common objectives and common themes the what and we are grateful for the uaps that is that are really enhancing that 
This is about Jesuits and collaborators in various places working together and taking leadership. And while that leadership is being enhanced by increasing professionalization, development of communication infrastructure, processes, procedures, we believe that this is emerging out of a growing greatness of heart, of hearts that are developing leaders without titles, capable of initiating and leading change and doing so with urgency and great commitment. Leaders at the very low levels who do not even depend on some hierarchy, but are animated by the spirit of Christ, by the need to make life work and meaningful for all, and to protect the planet. And so we are back to being, we are, being, we, are, we are back to being, there's a growing sense of coming from various conferences and networking. It's not just about what we are doing and the need to work together for greater impact. Yes, that's part of it, but that's not the complete story. It's about who we are, and that to be is to be with, as Gabriel Marcel once said, esse est co esse, to be is to be with, and to be in one body, and the body for the mission. So there's a recognition that while we care about impacts and about achieving goals, our network is, is not just for instrumental reasons, to achieve something, but increasing the consciousness of who we are together, how we are, and how we show up in the world. Other than the communication, enhanced communication professionalization, and this awareness of who we are, what we found also strong is that this is happening at various levels. We heard yesterday about global and the local. And this is what we found in the, in the reports, that there are actions that are coming from the local, or actions at the local level, and issues at the local level, but also issues that are global and actions that are local. They say think globally, but act locally. But what we saw is that there is both action and thinking at a global level as well as at um, uh, the, the, the local level. Um, oh, I forgot that. I thought it was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, so I, was, I thought it was Pablo is playing me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I've already what I wanted to say is that there's enhanced communication, and that communication is becoming more and more uh, professional, both uh, the internal communication, and in various places there have been set up structures for efficient communication, both internal and external, engaging not only ourselves, but also those who matter in terms of communication, the media houses, those who are capable of changing policy and various uh, uh, things. I already spoke about the, the relationship between the global and the local that is happening in this network. I just want to mention that there are several examples. For example, in, in JCAM, we are working with uh, the Jesuit mission office, offices uh, on questions of tax, on questions of, uh, of ecology at the global level, and it's happening also at uh, the local level where we are dealing with the same issues. I'll give it up to Ted now. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, uh, Charlie. Uh, so m moving on to uh, Another point that emerged strongly uh, from the reports that came in from the six conferences was the need to invest time and resources into our networks. And Roberto Jaramillo really underlined this well, I think, uh, this morning, that these, they don't happen on their own. We need to deliberately make the decisions to invest people's time, to invest the money in order to create strong networks and then in order to sustain them uh, over time. Uh, a related point that came up, there's always a, a risk with the networks. They, they certainly cost a, a, a lot. The, there's a significant amount of time, money, resources, uh, the environmental costs have been very present with me. So many people here kind of flying all the way from all over the world to come to, to Rome. Uh, and there's this risk that they may 
become, at their worst, simply long, expensive meetings. Uh, and we need to uh, counter that by being looking very carefully at what are the fruits that are coming from our networks, uh, to look closely at those, uh, to ensure that each network has a clear uh, focus, that we have some idea of what are the outcomes that we're looking for, what is the purpose for our uh, kind of getting together in a particular network. Uh, there need to be kind of accountability attached there as well on a number of levels. There can be a sort of inertia that comes into place with networks. Coming into the position that I'm in as conference delegate a little over a year ago, some networks you ask, okay, well, why do we meet? And sometimes the answer is, well, we all, we've, we've met for years. You know, we always get together. Uh, and sometimes it, it can become difficult to articulate the reason for that continuing uh, meeting. We need to kind of stay on top of those things. And, and account accountability means that, that sometimes we need to uh, to end networks or leave networks that aren't functioning uh, the way that, that would be uh, uh, most valuable at the time. Uh, we need to be very deliberate about which ones we join. I know I get all kinds of requests, people who want the Jesuits to be involved in a network that they're starting or an existing network, and we don't have the time, we don't have the capacity to be involved in all of them. So this uh, means being very deliberate about uh, making those, those choices. Another area that we were asked about uh, for the conference reports was proposals for global and regional actions. And there were a number of uh, themes that came up across the conferences. One was for greater collaboration among the Jesuit social centers across conferences. Uh, another one was uh, increasing Jesuit advocacy and in international fora. There's been some of, of that at the UN, for instance, and some other bodies. I know in uh, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, for instance, um, and there's certain Jesuit organizations have greater experience than, than we do uh, globally as a society in these uh, areas. Uh, joint actions around international days and events. This is something that comes up uh, repeatedly. We have a number of these on our calendar. The World Day of Migrants and Refugees came recently. Uh, this morning um, the, uh, was mentioned the season of creation in September into early October. These are great opportunities to promote one another's work and to see kind of globally what is the work that uh, our counterparts in, in other places are, are doing and, and helps us uh, see ourselves as working in this global uh, mission beyond the, the work that we may be doing in our own uh, cities, regions, and uh, countries. Uh, a, a number of conferences indicated an interest in clarifying the relationship with our global Ignatian advocacy networks. Uh, we may have a good opportunity for that very shortly. Valeria will be, be speaking with us on that. Uh, and also with JRS, uh, what are the, how, how does that relationship work between the social sector uh, and JRS? As Tom was, uh, Smolch was saying the other day, that JRS is being a, a part of the social sector. But it's a large institutional presence within the sector. Uh, and a, a final point here, that the search for global initiatives should not detract from regional possibilities. And I'm uh, thinking here partly of the reports, partly there's an excellent, uh, the new Promotio Justitiae, which everybody received for the conference. There's a great article that Tom Green uh, wrote, and he notes the, uh, a risk that is often present in our networks that we try to find something that every member can collaborate on. And at times that can be a positive thing, but at times that can detract from what might be more fruitful possibilities that could be pursued by a smaller group working on a regional basis as opposed to a global uh, basis. So in uh, thinking about these sort of larger actions, it's a call to, to kind of keep that in mind. And then finally, uh, just to end with the, the note that was noted in, in a number of places, that networking, it can be a slow process, uh, but there's a real commitment across the society to networking, which has very many benefits, as uh, uh, Charlie was speaking uh, to some of these uh, earlier. It, it certainly opens the doors 
to new initiatives that we would not come up with on our own. Uh, there's a great possibility for energizing people who are working on, on shared issues in other parts of the world. Great way, I mean, there's no better way for building trust than in meeting with one another, right? Really sharing in person, through calls, uh, our respective works, finding uh, works that we can collaborate on together. Uh, pr promotes that sense of belonging to the universal society of Jesus. I know I, as a novice, my novice master underlined this repeatedly. You're not entering the Canadian province of the Jesuits. You're entering the society of Jesus, which is a global uh, enterprise with a global mission. Uh, and equally uh, as important, this helps underline that fact for our many uh, lay colleagues, uh, that they're not working simply for a Jesuit work in one country, but they're partners with all of us across the world in the society. The, the range of perspectives that we get from meeting, discussing with one another, uh, gives us a much deeper understanding of the issues that we're working on. And then finally, we're simply more effective when we're working uh, together. When we're working, and here we mean together both within the Society of Jesus, across sectors, uh, and also, of course, when we're working with collaborators from outside the society, from other faith groups, with secular groups. This is really when we're at our best, when we can kind of work together. The image of the starlings, I think, will stay with me for a while, maybe for, for many of us. So uh, with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful summary, Ted and Charlie. Uh, before we begin our next session, uh, Ted mentioned some name of a Jesuit. I thought he will say something more. I said, okay, let me say it. Okay. Uh, we are happy a Jesuit, one who is amidst us, Father Tom Green, has been missioned as the new provincial of not sure which province, Central South Province of U.S. Yesterday, Father General <laughs> announced this, appointed him. I wish him and wish him all our prayers for Tom Green. <laughs> Tom told me, I'm not surprised, he's the right choice. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Uh, may I invite now um, Maria del Carmen Munoz, the moderator for the next session, to come to the dais, please. The next session will be on networking collaboration, a new way of proceeding in social apostolate. This session will go on uh, up to 4.15, 4 .15. Then we have a coffee break. Then 4.45 to 5.15 will be the guided prayer. Then 15 minutes of meeting of women delegate with Father General. We go into the groups at 5.30. So please make note of it in the schedule change. 5.30 to 6.30 is the group sharing. 6.30 we come back for prayer. We will begin without any delay the panel discussion, the last panel of this Congress. Let me introduce to the Aula uh, the very eminent uh, moderator we have with us. Maria del Carmen Munoz. 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 Okay, I'm sorry. Munoz. Not Spanish, English. Okay, sorry. Thank you. She's a woman committed with the social mission of the church. To do, to do so, she trained herself as a social worker. She has specialized in social and public policy and a master's degree in environmental management. Knowledge that she shares from the pedagogy of peace and reconciliation, a theme which we have been grappling with, with the communities, victims of armed conflict. In addition to the studies, she has dedicated most of her life to working with vulnerable populations, such as young people from the House of Youth of La China, Bogota, Colombia, and from CLC. She has spent the last 19 years 
working for the achievement of peace and reconciliation in her country. She has lived in different regions of the country, building from the foundations, pedagogical and advocacy processes that empower the inhabitants to be generators of their own development. And I asked her, what do you like in this conference? And she said, from this meeting, she loves diversity. Thank you, Carmen, for sharing this. You can take over now and invite the participants. Muchísimas gracias, Joe. Um, con esa presentación de trayectoria, ustedes podrían sospechar que tengo más años de los que pareciera que tengo, pero no se dejen engañar. Puede ser que ha sido cosas como paralelas y tal, pero efectivamente sí siento una convicción profunda porque nosotros los seres humanos y en particular las mujeres tenemos la capacidad transformadora, no solamente de la, de la humanidad, de los seres, sino también de los contextos. Eh, me siento honrada en presentar este panel porque fíjense ustedes que tiene una característica particular y es que es un mix, una mezcla, ¿sí? Aquí vamos a tener una reflexión importante sobre eh, cómo eh, se trabaja en red y se colabora, pero de una manera distinta o novedosa que nos permite proceder a nivel de nuestros, de nuestros centros sociales. Entonces, creo que eso va a ser muy importante porque lo vamos a contrastar contra dos experiencias, una de mis amigas de la India y otra de mi amigo Christopher Kerr, que son sumamente interesantes y seguro varios de ustedes ya las conocen, pero luego vamos a tener la reacción o la respuesta de nuestro amigo Padre Vator, quien tiene una experticia tremenda, ¿sí? también en varios eh, espacios y en varios trabajos del sector social eh, de una manera mucha más amplia. De antemano quiero disculparme porque mi pronunciamiento sobre el lenguaje indio y sobre el lenguaje eh, africano puede ser algo escaso o no. Entonces, ustedes me disculparán, yo traté de estudiar lo necesario, pero me perdonarán si se me llega a ir la lengua en alguno de esos aspectos. Eh, bien, voy a presentarles, voy a llamarlos uno por uno y se los voy presentando, ¿de acuerdo? La primera oradora que tengo aquí, una persona sumamente interesante, es Valeria Méndez de Vigo. Ella coordina la incidencia, las redes internacionales y la comunicación dentro del Secretariado de Justicia Social y Ecología en Roma desde hace un año. Estuvo involucrada de manera activa en el nacimiento de la Global Ignatian Advocacy New York, New Works, a través de su trabajo previo en Entre Culturas, como responsable del Departamento de Estudios de Incidencia, es abogada con diversos posgrados en cooperación al desarrollo, metodologías participativas, derechos humanos y liderazgo y gestión en ONGs y más de 20 años de experiencia en diversas, en diversas organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Ella está especializada y se interesa por los temas de incidencia pública, participación y gobernanza, educación y más recientemente migraciones y refugio. Bienvenida Valeria aquí a este a este espacio. A las segundas personas que quiero presentarles a ustedes es a nuestros amigos Vijay Kumar Parmar eh, y a mi amiga Ruby Mari Kujur. Eh, Vijay, él ha sido colaborador jesuita desde 1980. Él ha estado trabajando por la causa de los marginados, eligió dedicar su vida, a pesar de que tenía muchas ofertas para buenos transportistas, fue director ejecutivo de Javi, Javi Oral Science Center de Amejadat durante muchos años, un centro jesuita de acción social en Gujarat. Más tarde fue director ejecutivo de Han Vikas de Amejadat, una organización paraguas de las ONGs. Ha sido consultor de muchos movimientos de base, es consultor de Lokmanch, que de hecho es la experiencia que nos van a compartir en este espacio eh, durante alrededor de tres años. Tiene mucho conocimiento y habilidades en experiencias relacionadas con los trabajos de movimiento. Es un activista social entusiasta y positivo y un motivador. Es una fuente de inspiración para muchos y también puede desafiar a miles. Bienvenido, eh, Vijay, a este espacio. 
de mi amiga Ruby, quiero decir que ella ha estado en el campo del trabajo social desde que dedicó su vida como hermana religiosa a acompañar a los marginados. Ella pertenece a la congregación de hermanas Ursulinas. Sirvió eh, servicio con una sonrisa, es el estilo de funcionamiento, como gerente de programa de Logmash desde, hace, desde que comenzó prácticamente. Ella ha, si, ha podido apoyar a los socios y líderes con paciencia, con comprensión y con aprecio. Ella tiene la capacidad de manejar en un mismo espacio 100 socios y de controlarlo de una manera extraordinaria. Eh, ella tiene una facilidad de manejo, de, muestra un gran sentido de humanidad y aparte de eso, eh, ella es un gran modelo a seguir por las diferentes personas. Long Manch tiene la suerte de tener a una persona tan dedicada y comprometida como tú, Ruby, en esa, en esa organización. Qué gusto tenerte en este espacio. Bueno, mi otro orador que tiene una larga hoja de vida y experiencia, es Christopher Kerr, eh, director, de, director ejecutivo de la Red de Solidaridad Ignaciana ISN, ocupa ese cargo desde el 2011, tiene casi 20 años de experiencia en defensa de la justicia social y el liderazgo en la educación y el Ministerio Católico. La Red de Solidaridad Ignaciana es una organización nacional de educación y defensa de la justicia social dirigida por laicos y con sede en los Estados Unidos, basada en la doctrina social católica y en la espiritualidad ignaciana. Él, él es mejor conocido porque él promueve algo que muchos de ustedes conocen, que es la enseñanza de la familia ignaciana por la justicia la mayor reunión anual católica de justicia social en los Estados Unidos. ISN también involucra cientos de miles de personas cada año a través de programas en persona y en línea, campañas de promoción y contenidos del sitio web y recursos. Antes de él, ISN, Cris desempeñó múltiples funciones en la Universidad John Carroll, una universidad jesuita a las afueras de Cleveland, Ohio, que incluyó la coordinación de viajes de aprendizaje de inmersión internacional a corto plazo y educación en justicia social como codirector inaugural del programa Arrupe Scholar for Social de John Carroll. Eh, de, se, de, se, se desempeñó como maestro y administrador en los niveles de primaria y secundaria en la diócesis católica de Cleveland, eh, sobre la educación y defensa de la justicia social, la misión jesuita y una amplia gama de temas de justicia social. Completó sus estudios de pregrado y posgrado en la Universidad John Carroll. Bien, y... Eh, Metodológicamente, no es que no vaya a presentarles aquí a mi amigo el padre eh, Bator, ni más falta vaya, que aquí está aguardándonos. Solamente que este panel tiene una metodología un poco particular. Primero van a estar las presentaciones, empieza Valeria y va a tener 20 minutos, luego va a tener, eh, va a tener Ruby y Vijay también. 10 minutos para eh, expresar su experiencia, luego 10 minutos también va a tener eh, eh, va a tener Christopher y ahí sí va a haber una nivel de re, un nivel de reacción o respuesta que va a estar a cargo de, eh, de Padre Orobator. En, Bator. Entonces, en ese momento lo llamaré acá, presentaré su hoja de vida, que no es nada despreciable y él dará cuenta entonces de las eh, reacciones a las exposiciones anteriores. Dado que el tiempo que me han señalado en mi libreto es muy exigente, les voy a rogar el favor que se circunscriban al tiempo que les corresponde. Entonces, le voy a dar la palabra en este momento a Valeria. 20 minutos, Valeria. Bien puedas. Pues muchísimas gracias, eh, Mari Carmen. La verdad es que me siento súper honrada de estar en esta mesa. Y, un, y ciertamente un poco, un poco abrumada también. Mi presentación eh, va a ser en inglés y va a versar sobre las Global Ignatian Advocacy Networks. And I would like to, to begin with a sentence of the General Congregation 35, which uh, reads as follows. 
the complexity of the problems we face and the richness of the opportunities offered demand that we engage in building bridges between rich and poor and establish advocacy links of mutual support between those who hold political power and those who find it difficult to voice their interests. And I would like to, to talk in my presentation about uh, mainly five major points. Firstly, the beginning of GIAN at the Les Corial uh, 11 years ago in 2008. Some conclusions about an evaluation of the GIAN networks, which were uh, undertaken uh, in 2018, uh, one year and a half ago. Then I'd like to point out some learnings and press pr practices, and I'd like to finish with the challenges and opportunities, and maybe with the little glimpse of the way forward. So everything began in November 2008. There was an advocacy uh, a workshop, Ignition Advocacy Workshop, held at the Escorial. And uh, probably many of the people who are in this picture that you are seeing there are here in this classroom right now, in this Aula Magna. You know? And I like to point out only, uh, well, Father Xavier Yejarac, of course, he was there in the first line, okay, but then you were not the, the Secretary for Social, for Social Justice and Ecology. And Father Arturo Sosa was also there but he wasn't at that time Father General, of course. And, and I'd like also to have a special memory for uh, Father Fernando Franco, who was at that moment the Social Justice and Ecology Secretary, and who had also the initiative under the Secretariat of this, uh, of this uh, workshop. And uh, let me also add that in this workshop, and you will remember many of those who were there, you will remember there was such a positive energy. It was a Kairos moment, really. And somehow I recognize the same positive energy that we are having here uh, 11 years later. So let us see, let us see what can we do also and what will be also the outcomes and what can be born also of this, of this uh, gathering 11 years later. Okay. So, because there, what happened in this Kairos moment were the several global Ignatian advocacy networks were born. And four of them are functioning. Uh, one dealing with ecology, eco Jesuit. Uh, we have uh, his leader, you know very well, Father Pedro Walpol. And then we have also the Right to Education Network, or Edu Jesuit. And the uh, leader is Father Carlos Fritzen of Feia Alegria, okay, recently appointed. And then we have the Justice in Mining Network, and whose leadership is uh, by Albuan, and Guillermo Otano is there. And also we have the Migration Network, and uh, the Red Jesuita con Migrantes, and Javi Cortegoso is also the leader. All of them are here. Okay, so those were, or those are, some of the issues which were considered relevant in the social agenda of the Society of Jesus. And during these years, of course, there was a lot of kind of conceptualizing and kind of um, positioning uh, politically also the networks. You, know, you will see some of the documents, particularly in Promotio Justitia, you know, dealing with what is Ignatian advocacy exactly, or, and dealing also with some positioning regarding ecology, education, migration, and justice in mining. I would like to invite you to go and to read uh, those. They are still very, very valid. And uh, last year, in April 2018, there was some ev ev evaluation of the, of the GN networks launched by the Social Justice and Ecology Secretariat. It was thought that after 10 years, it was a good moment to, to somehow see what were the, the main outcomes and also the main shortcomings of the networks. And, and I'd like just to glimpse a little bit at the conclusions. And I'm telling you, 
uh, I'm not being complacent. I'm not being complacent because the evaluation was not complacent either in many ways. So the first conclusion was that the GN networks are a very good and a very pioneer initiative connecting global response to key issues. And they said, or the, 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 the respondents said, that they had achieved very valu valuable outcomes, particularly in communication, in awareness raising, and in networking. Not so much in advocacy. There were some difficulties, some complexities associated with some of the existing Jesuit governance, particularly. And there was, or, or the people thought that there was some kind of lack of strategy. And yes, of course, there was lack of allocation of resources and capacities. And uh, it was recognized that GR networks were created as a part of, this, of the Society of Jesus' commitment to justice and reconciliation. And this initial intuition, in, intuition was confirmed by General Congregation 36. And Father General, present at this meeting, he said, or he referred to Gian as a relatively new project that had some difficulties and asked the team to find focus, passion, energy, and direction. And this is what the leaders and the, and the teams and everybody is trying to do. So some of the learnings um, of each of the networks that I would like to point out very briefly. In Justice in Mining, uh, they pointed out particularly that uh, the network provided an open space of dialogue and reflection, particularly about e extractivism. They had also undertaken global and conference action plans and strategies, mainly dealing with three topics like unethical behavior, criminalization of human rights defenders, and environmental devastation. I think Guillermo has brought also some samples of the strategic plans, if you would like to know a little bit more about that. And uh, among the best practices identified, there, there was the interconference collaboration, but also the co collaboration and alliances uh, within different Catholic net networks, of course, the Dicastery, and of course, our friends of JPIC and Sister Sheila that you um, met uh, before, and Iglesia Simeneria, CITSE, etc., and also with some other external actors and networks. And also, they pointed out the, um, the gathering in different uh, international fora, like the thematic social forum on mining in Johannesburg. In edu uh, regarding edu Jesuit or the right to education, what I would like to point out mainly was the discourse and political positioning around the right to education, with a very, very, very clear focus on the marginalized people. They do have the experience and uh, politically and in the discourse, that was, I think, one of the main achievements, a very uh, important achievement. And then, of course, they also had some awareness campaigns. Maybe you might remember the Right to Education, Right to Hope campaign, some of you. And they produced quite of fantastic materials and, pro and product, products, including communication tools. Regarding Ian migration, let me tell you that I am amazed by the updated analysis on forced migration in different contexts. And they are going to, to have a publication in the couple of months dealing with forced migration in a global context, and also the possibility of the convergence of three campaigns on hospitality. And regarding Eco-Jesuit, uh, well, I would like to point out the global strategic plan. Also, many of you probably have been encouraged by Eco-Jesuit uh, to participate in the global climate strike, which was held in September, they issued a statement, they made a lot of alliances, they made a very big mobilization. And then also, of course, the whole issue of advocacy for the COP25, uh, posing climate change as a human rights violation. And of course, I'm sure you know also very well there are strong communication tools. I strongly invite you to be part also of the website, eco streaming, etc., and the participation in different international fora like the COP and very recently the Amazonian Synod. Okay, some opportunities that we see in spite of some shortcomings also. 
The whole idea of collaboration, networking, and also advocacy is gaining momentum in the society of Jesus. I think also the, the, the issue of giving such a long space in this uh, fifth anniversary somehow is a sign of that. The launching of the UAP sets a new framework for social and ecological justice. That's very sure, and that this has been also very much mentioned during the sessions. And also, of course, it, is, it has already been mentioned by Jeffrey Sachs and many others. There's also a new international framework with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030, the Global Compact for Migration and the Binding Treaty on Business and Human Rights. So the way forward, I'd like yes to a little glimpse would be to establish global strategy with vision and mission in line with the universal apostolic preferences and other processes at the Society of Jesus and in the international context, establish clear governance structures. I, I'd like to underli underline this, promoting prophetic advocacy. Somebody mentioned it in the other session. I do believe that Jesuit institutions had the opportunity and also the responsibility to promote prophetic advocacy. And I would like to challenge you and to encourage you on that, because I think in the last year it has lost some weight. Might be my impression, but in spite of the very, I'm sure, the very fantastic initiatives that we have, somehow, both in the discourse and both in the practice, I have the impression that advocacy has lost some weight. We have heard today the Pope that he has encouraged us also to participate in the political sphere where political decisions are being taken. And while the building of linkages and common narratives, uh, promoting coordination and intersectoriality, and promoting branding, knowledge, and sustainability. A word, small word about resources, they have been emphasized. It seems pretty obvi obvious, but in fact, it's obvious, but somehow, I don't know why, but suddenly sometimes resources in terms of funds, capacities, etc., are needed. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Y ver cómo ahorró de tiempo, ¿no? Qué maravilla. Eh, ahora le voy a dar la palabra a nuestros amigos de Lockmanch para que ellos nos narren su experiencia. Entonces, tienes la palabra eh, Bihai, Kumar y eh, Ruby. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, my dear Jesuit <coughs> priest and uh, collaborators, including religious sisters. I have my colleague, sister Ruby Mary, a very nice human person. So both of us will make a presentation. The presentation is in three parts. First, I will introduce. Then we have the video presentation. And then sister Ruby Mary will make conclusions. So I'll start with uh, uh, Lokmanch. Uh, but before starting, I would like to thank Father Sani Vai, Father Denzil, and uh, many others, Jesuits, providing me this opportunity and to be part of uh, Lokmanch. Now, uh, let me just talk to you about context in which Lokmanch has been uh, initiated. Whenever you go to UN and when you hear Indian diplomats, Indian government diplomats, you hear the first thing that India is the largest democracy. In Geneva, I have attended many human rights council sessions. This is the first statement they say. We have very progressive laws and schemes for the socio-economic empowerment of the marginalized communities. We have Dalit as the president. We have Dalit chief minister. We have, and they will go on and on. And we have no problems. Everything is all right. So complete denial mode. We have a complete denial by the Indians at global level. If there are so many progressive laws, then what are the problems? We have major gaps in implementation of these laws. Very progressive law. We have a very progressive constitution also. And India is one of the countries, very few countries, where there is a culture of discrimination even within the government system. It is, it is very much existing in the society, but it is also existing 
in the government system based on caste based on gender based on religion largely these are the three and that's why people are poor malnourished faces violence violence and they live without dignity that dignity is robbed literally robbed if you look at according to fao un report 2019 very recent 194.4 million people are malnourished highest in the world 51.4% women in reproductive age between 50 59 49 are anemic they are not able to grow properly and that results into a vicious cycle of malnourishment even for the children children 37.9% children below 5 years are stunted they are prevented from their growth and this is the biggest number in india in global poverty index india rank 103 out of 119 countries so one of the uh, lowest next rise in atrocities against dalits if you see mob lynching mob violence against dalits dalits are the untouchables i am one of them and in spite of higher education higher economic growth even if i am highly developed i will be i will be uh, discriminated uh, and in 2015 38670 crimes took place against dalits while in 2016 40801 so the crimes against dalits are increasing instead of reducing millions of adivasis tribals as we call it indigenous people they get displaced due to so called development by mining by industrial projects by power projects conflict induced displacement there are two types of displacement one is development induced development displacement another is conflict conflict induced displacement on the rise especially among dalits and muslim because out of purely conflict fear violence they are not able to live in their own locality they have to be displaced which is unrecorded government has no policy for conflict induced displacement they have policy for the development induced policies muslims and adivasis the largest numbers more than 50% as under trials in prisons without any trials and these are the figures given by the government of india law and for law enforcement agencies government officers they themselves practice and touch they are unac unaccountable and there is a impunity they get away with whatever they do even if there are custodial death they just break laws they just simply get away uh, with all that's called impunity let me also share because lokmanch is a jesuit initiative some theological uh, background and i think uh, this is something we need to understand i think that's a, a kind of integration that lokmanch has been able to exhibit god created and everything was good we all say that bible say that due to disobedience of adam and eve sin came into the world and so and there are consequences as we God heard the cry of the people as Moses uh, to give goodness to the poor to tell prisoners that they have to be freedom even when John say that so that you may have to you may have life to its full love one another love your neighbor i think this is very very difficult at times we love ourselves but there is also saying that you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself and i think there is a major contradiction that is happening when we see more violence more blinching in india we the jesuits and collaborators continue to hear the cry of the people and try to respond in a meaningful way how do we do it so there are certain guiding principles of lokmanch go to the people and i think this is very important we have to be part of the people people part of us and we become part of the people live with them learn from them don't go as that we know everything love them as much as you love yourself start what with what you what they know not what with we know build with what they have but with best leaders when the work is done the task gets accomplished the people will still say 
we have done this ourselves. And I think that's very important that we become invisible in the whole process. Then when people say that, this is what uh, we have done. So what is Lokmanch? Lokmanch is a platform, as it was said, that it is a network of civil society leaders, civil society organizations, and community leaders making efforts at local to national level to hold government accountable through collective actions. So we are holding government accountable so that they don't get away through our collective actions. Lokmanch evolved as a result of collaboration between Jesuit social centers, religious organizations, and lay organizations. So we have 34 Jesuit organizations, 26 religious, and 38 lay organizations. And lay organizations include from Dalits, and Adivasis, and Muslims, and Christians. So there is a very big diversity among ourselves. And also languages. Lokmanch practices rights-based approach with special focus on empowerment. Because we don't want to make people dependent so that people get empowered, so that they're able to fight for their own rights. The issue-based issues focused are right to food, employment, access to basic amenities, land, housing, health, education, etc. Now we have the video presentation. In a vast country with a huge population and rising aspirations, progress is the political buzzword. In tune with the beat of the 21st century, it's the market that rules the economy. The global investors have to be attracted. The aspiring urban middle classes have to be given new shiny toys. Development is like a shop window and the pace of progress is measured by the heartbeats of the stock markets. In August 2019, the National Human Rights Commission reminded the government that a majority of the population in India is still unable to get at least one complete square meal a day. The government has some fine schemes and programs for development of the vast rural areas. But the fact is that the poor cannot benefit from these schemes which come knotted with red tape. The way is strewn with official hurdles, application forms, digital verification, identity cards, ration cards, and so on. A person using the knowledge and guidance of Lokmanch is emboldened to speak out to the powerful and demand his entitlements. And in the struggle, no one is left alone. This young movement rests on the unity and coordination of 100 partner organizations. How do we provide a space for all our people so that they are well exposed to the many opportunities that are happening in and around the world? And that's where something came in handy in the form of World Social Forum. We brought people together in Mumbai uh, we need to also provide space to bring together most of these Jesuit social centers along with their partners. We didn't know how it will work, but we said we are called to do this work, we will make it work. After some 20 months of preparation, Lokmanch emerged as a human rights driven, secular, inclusive platform that contributes to various social movements of the marginalized. 
Logmuch is a platform of community leaders and civil society organizations. We work for the basic rights of the marginalized communities. We engage with the people and administrators at block, panjayat, municipality, state and national level. The formal inauguration of Lokmanch took place in a workshop at Delhi in April 2006. The basic right to food training module was prepared and released on that day. These households belonged to the poor from every religion and caste. The data was used to analyze the gaps that prevent the people from getting various entitlements. अभी तक सरकार पैसा नहीं दिया है इसलिए शौचालय नहीं बना है इसलिए हम सब बाहर ही जाते हैं हमारे घर में शौचालय नहीं जाने पड़ता है बाहर गोरख मांझे शिवाला पर सापुर थाना जिला पटना सरकार द्वारा हम लोग के पानी के कोई व्यवस्था नहीं है लोक मंच इज अ प्लेटफॉर्म फॉर एंपावरिंग कम्युनिटी लीडरशिप एंड कम्युनिटी बेस्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस दिस स्ट्रेंथेंस एंड सस्टेंस grassroots level movements contributing to a just, democratic and secular society. Through bottom-up structural linkage and decentralized decision-making processes, space was created to build leaders and informed citizens in the communities. Lokmanch has been a model for collaboration and networking among Jesuits and their partners. This program has attracted the attention of not only people in the country but also people abroad. When a dream is shared with many, then it starts becoming a reality. And in the case of Lokmanch, it is very true. We share the dream with the leaders, with the communities, with the CSOs, NGOs, with Jesuits, other collaborators. And there was a lot of enthusiasm and hope raised. The empowerment process starts with interaction and meetings between trained Lokmanch animators and the focus group. The people decide when and how they will go forward. Technically supported by the local Lokmanch partner. Our name is Devlagan मुखिया के द्वारे काम मिला है हमको मनने के योजना से काम मिलना शुरू हुआ हमारा नाम पर्वती देवी हम दोस्त नगर मुसाड़ी से बोल रहे हैं हमारा दो बच्चा है सरकारी ने पड़ता छात्रवृत्ति मिला ओवर द पास्ट 2 इयर्स सम 3003 कम्युनिटी एंटाइटलमेंट्स हैव बीन एक्सेस्ड इंपैक्टिंग अ थर्ड ऑफ अ मिलियन हाउसहोल्ड्स How do I describe Lok Manch? It is like a tribal dance with the Jesuits, the implementing partners, the community leaders and the common people. They are all swinging to one rhythm. In Lokmanch, all hundred units are moving forwards with a synergy, a beautiful sight indeed. This is just the beginning. There are miles to go. The combined faith of all our partners, collaborators and well-wishers is our strength. Eh, muy 
bien, qué hermoso video. Eh, creo que nos ilustran una dimensión cultural muy importante que hace parte como de, de un escenario para ver otras formas de, de trabajar, ¿no? No sé si tú quieras hacernos algunos comentarios y reacciones sobre el video. Uh, so, this was the small clip of Lokmanj intervention. So, we go ahead with the achievements. How through Lokmanj intervention, we have achieved so many uh, entitlements. And this is listed of individual entitlements and individual household entitlements. And here uh, you, you will see on your table the leaflets and flyers given based on the achievements. And here some of our partners are here, Jesuits, non-Jesuit collaborators are present here. And they have mot motivated the people and the community leaders, and they have achieved these entitlements. And these are the lists of uh, community entitlements. Then as a conclusion, I would say that this is the concrete results have been achieved with regard to people's access to various entitlements. And local governments have been encapped to make them more inclusive. And more than 5,000 community leaders capacitated are taking leadership for these rights. And collaboration is working. It has its own challenges, but all are learning to collaborate. And sustainability of Lokmanji is part of the design, but there is a long way to go. And as I conclude, I would say that uh, uh, Lokmanj is a great opportunity and same time is a touchstone to test our skill and capacity to work with the marginalized and communities and working with the poor and support both Jesuits and others to continue and also to test our strategies to access people's entitlements through social and political activism. And also it is collectively we become the voice of the poor in the words of our Pope Francis. And also we are enabling them to speak up or speak for. And this is how we go very much along with the call given by G6 GC36 for collaboration and networking. Thank you. And at the end, I would like to thank our partners. I would like to ask them to stand wherever they are, just to acknowledge their hard work. Lokman's partners. I would like to thank our donors who are present here, and by their support, we could do this. And here present Jenny Cafiso from Canadian Mission. <laughs> Maria Delmar from Alburn. Father Klaus, Father Klaus from German Mission, Father Klaus. <laughs> Father Renato, Father Renato from Magis. <laughs> and Paul Chitnes from London Mission, UK. <laughs> and thanks to Father Joe, um, Father Sunny Bhai and all CSS, Jesuits, through their intervention uh, initiative, we could start this Lokmanj program. Father Sunny Bhai and Father Joe, thanks to you. And thanks, <laughs> and thanks to all of you for your good wishes. Thank you. Bien, un agradecimiento especial a Vijay Kumar y a um, Rubí porque esto ha sido un ejemplo importante de cómo se pueden materializar experiencias reales de cara a novedades en nuestra acción social. 
Le voy a dar la palabra ahora a Christopher. Bienvenido. Thank you. I left my tie on as an act of solidarity with the Jesuits that didn't have time to go home and, and change their clerics, so rock on. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with a few uh, statistics to give you a context of the United States. Uh, three million living alumni of Jesuit universities and secondary schools, 225 students currently enrolled in those schools, tens of thousands of parish families, thousands of current and former Jesuit volunteer corps members, uh, and over 10% of US Congress persons were educated by the Jesuits. These numbers give you a sense of, of the breadth of the Jesuit network in the United States and the potential influence it could have in building a more just, just society from, from the United States. Uh, 15 years ago, in 2004, the Ignatian Solidarity Network was uh, founded as a lay-led organization that would serve as a conduit for collaborative work for social justice in a robust and complex Jesuit network in the United States. A network with tremendous potential, as illustrated by the statistics I just shared. However, our history predates uh, 2004. Um, going back to the mid-1990s, in the wake of the murders of the six Jesuits and two lay women, uh, killed at the UCA in El Salvador. In 1995, as the relationship between U.S. foreign intervention and the murders at the UCA was becoming more obvious, lay leaders with deep connections to the Jesuits sought to unite the Jesuit network to call attention to this reality. Specifically, they hoped they could leverage the Jesuit network to speak out against the long history of U.S. military training of Central American soldiers including 19 of the 26 soldiers who slaughtered the Jesuits and their lay companions in 1989. In the midst of growing public attention to the U.S. role, these lay leaders created a space for Jesuit school students, faculty, and alumni, parishioners of Jesuit parishes, and many others to join people who were gathering yearly at the gates of a U.S. military base to prophetically call uh, through public vigil uh, for an end to this military training, this U.S. military training. This gathering, which began in a tent in a muddy field a mile from the military ba base, became known as the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. People of all ages, but especially youth, gathered to hear powerful speakers, to pray, meet new people, and celebrate the Eucharist together on the, clo on the closing night. It was a, an, a powerful experience of hope, of network, and of church. And 22 years later, the teaching continues. Next week, we will gather in Washington, D.C. for the teaching. Over 2,000 people, 80% of them between the ages of 16 and 24, will converge for three days of learning, reflection, prayer, and action. And on the final day, the delegates will visit the United States Capitol to meet with members of the U.S. Congress and call on them to pass legislation that protects the dignity of people who migrate as well as our Earth. It's important to note that that, that mass visit, that large visit of nearly 2,000 people to the U.S. Congress will be the largest Catholic Advocacy Day in the United States this year. Now, building on the story of the teaching. Uh, and its role in, our, as, uh, in how we developed, how the Ignatian Solidarity Network developed, there are a few key elements about our founding that I think are really important to note in the context of this uh, panel. The first is that ISN was founded as an independent, lay-led organization that would work in partnership with the Society of Jesus. While, the, while Jesuits and their institutions are integrally involved in, the work, uh, in, in our work, all of ISN staff are lay people. The vast majority of people involved with ISN pro ISN's programs and campaigns are lay people. And the governing board includes a few Jesuits, but has consistently been majority lay. Secondly, ISN committed to working with all sectors of Jesuit ministry, higher education, secondary education, pastoral and social ministry, becoming one of few organizations in the U.S. Jesuit network committed to cross-sector collaboration focused on social justice. 
Third, ISN has one of few, is one of few organizations established to work across all U.S. Jesuit provinces. And today, with the U.S. and Canada, as well as Haiti and Belize, all becoming part of one conference, it has created the opportunity to expand some of our work even beyond the United States. And maybe most notably, uh, while ISN began in response to the martyrs of El Salvador, its evolution was also deeply influenced by the calls for Jesuit lay collaboration of General Congregations 30, uh, 34 and 35, the call to deepen the work of networks uh, that uh, came in General Congregation 36, and today by the Universal Apostolic Preferences, uh, which affirm our commitment, our, the Ignatian Solidarity Network's commitment to working for justice through an Ignatian spiritual lens, our significant engagement with young adults affiliated with the Jesuit educational institutions, and our focus both on the marginalized and on care for, for our common home. So what does our mission of collaboration and networking look like today, 15 years since our founding? Well, we have eight lay staff, each with experiences of Jesuit education and, the, and Ignatian, the Ignatian spiritual tradition who work on issue areas, areas programming, and our digital presence and networking. Uh, we have over 100 member institutions that co-labor with us each year. These include Jesuit as well as other Catholic uh, like-minded colleges and universities, secondary schools, parishes, and social ministries. These institutions participate in a wide range of networking meetings and online gatherings that unite faculty, staff, students, alumni, parishioners, and others together to learn about key justice issues facing society, discover ways to work more collaboratively to, uh, together as an Ignatian family, as well as to take action through legislative advocacy and prophetic public witness for a more just world. Now, when I reflect on what most exemplifies co-laboring, collaboration that exists between ISN and the Society of Jesus, an example comes to mind. As you all know, probably too well, the attitude toward immigrants changed drastically in the United States since the election of President Trump in 2016, furthering the need for our network to place itself on the margins with those most vulnerable to the dehumanizing rhetoric and policies that have been enacted. In 2018, a Jesuit university student in her final year of studies reached out to us for assistance. Her father, was facing uh, deportation to Guatemala by U.S. immigration officials. She desperately hoped that her father, who had lived in the U.S. for over 30 years, could remain in the United States long enough to see her graduate later that year. Over the next few months, the Ignatian Solidarity Network, the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States, and the Midwest Jesuit Province worked hand in hand to bring attention to this family story. This included generating thousands of, thousands of letters that were sent to U.S. immigration officials, leveraging relationships with media and other communications partners to lift up the story in the media, and inviting key leaders, including the family's local archbishop, as well as members of the U.S. Congress to show their support for the family. Our networks, or our, excuse me, our efforts as a network culminated with a press conference where the young woman shared her family story and then Father Tim Kosicki, who is the president of the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States, spoke publicly in support of the family and all families facing separation and marginalization at the hands of U.S. immigration policies. The student felt deeply supported by the Ignatian family, and her family's story shined greater light on the realities that immigrant families face in our country. Many people's hearts were changed by being part of this effort in some way. Before I end, I also wanted to share some brief reflections on what we have come to learn about networking. And I say what we've come to learn. We don't know everything, and we learn every day. There are four values of a network that I would like to emphasize. Context, community, cultivation, and having a captain. A network needs, to, needs context for this work, uh, for its work. In the Ignatian tradition, this context is a deep desire to embrace God's love for us and respond by sharing that love with others through acts of service and justice. For us in the United States, it was initially the deaths of the martyrs at the UCA and our government's complicity that united us. 
Context provides purpose, and purpose keeps people working together. In our work with young people, young people especially, we find there is a deep desire to be part of this Jesuit context. They hunger for a church that lives out the gospel in prophetic ways. Young people often find this context through experiences of encounter with those most impacted by injustice and come to recognize the other as equal, brothers and sisters, consequently breaking down the barriers of us and them and creating a context built on the idea of one human family. And this image comes from a group of ours that was at the U.S.-Mexico border in El Paso, Texas. The second element of a network is a sense of community. It is imperative for people to feel a personal connection in any way possible. While this connection can be deepened through their engagement virtually, uh, via web conference, social media, Twitter, whatever, whatever it is, we find that creating ways to bring people together in person is imperative. They must come to know each other, to share their stories, their joys, their struggles, to, to connect with each other in person. And those most directly impacted by injustice must be included in this work, in this community, this network. A few years ago, a young woman who attended the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice in Washington, D.C., said this about her experience and the value of community. She said, the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice, which I told you about, reminds me that I am not alone. I am part of a community and an Ignatian family with shared goals and a common purpose to uproot injustice, to sow truth, and to witness transformation. Thirdly, a network needs cultivation. While bringing people together for collaborative projects, advocacy, or public action can be very meaningful, Networks do not sustain themselves without the ongoing cultivation to ensure that people remain connected and involved in the ongoing work. Since 2016, ISN has sustained a group of educators committing to stand with immigrant members of their school communities, their campus communities. These are faculty and staff, administrators. One of the reasons that this group continues to convene is because of our staff's dedication to providing spaces for them to gather and resources to sustain their efforts. In short, they feel continually part of something larger. And finally, a network requires a captain, some individual or group of individuals who wake up each morning both available and committed to sustaining the collaborative spirit of the network with a longer vision in mind. In the U.S., the Ignatian Solidarity Network, through a partnership with the Jesuits and their institutions, has become one of these entities, an organization with the capacity and the availability to both initiate and sustain collaboration. In closing, I want to say that it is an honor to represent the Ignatian Solidarity Network, uh, our 15 years of co-laboring co with the Jesuits, uh, and our ongoing work at this Congress. Seriously, it's an honor for us, for our work. Earlier, I mentioned that we will gather next week in Washington, D.C. for the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. And the theme for this year's teaching is radical hope, prophetic action. And I want each of you here today to know that as I welcome the crowd of 2,000 people, especially the young people, to our gathering place next week, I'm going to share with them the spirit of this gathering I'm going to share with them the words of Pope Francis. And we'll be united as one Ignatian family there, just as we're united as one Ignatian family here. And we'll all, all of us, here and there, be one, prophetically working for justice with radical hope. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity and for listening to my reflections. Thank you. Eh, muchísimas gracias, eh, Cris, por esos aportes tan valiosos y evidentemente tu experticia, yo creo que es eh, meritorio conocerla en otros escenarios y de manera más amplia. Nos puede ayudar mucho a generar organización a otro nivel. Ahora sí quiero llamar aquí, no, pero a él, pero a él lo queremos aquí. ¿Lo van a poner allá? Okay. Bueno. 
Bien, eh, quiero presentarles al Padre Bator. Él es un jesuita nigeriano, es responsable de la Compañía de Jesús para toda África, ex rector de Hakima University College en Nairobi. Es considerado como uno de los teólogos más brillantes a nivel internacional. Es miembro de la Junta Directiva de la Universidad de Georgetown y da conferencias y charlas en todo el mundo. Bienvenido, padre. Es un placer tenerlo en este espacio. Muchas gracias. I've been asked to offer a reflection on challenges and opportunities for networking and collaboration in the social apostolate. From my own vision, and to connect such reflection, if possible, with the experiences of Global Ignatian Advocacy Network, Lock Manch, and Ignatian Solidarity Network. And I would like to do this by way of a few observations. My first observation concerns the spiritual dimension of networking as I hear it. Ignatian spirituality advocates seeing reality as a whole, not as discrete and isolated parts. And as we see in the contemplation of the incarnation in the spiritual exercises, God's vision of the world encompasses the great extent of the circuit of the world with peoples so many and so diverse. It is a connected and highly networked world where diverse, though it may be, birth intersects with death. Laughter intertwines with lamentation. Health coexists with sickness. Peace is threatened by war. And so viewed through this Ignatian lens, to borrow the phrase of Chris Kerr, networking appears as an invitation to see and to actively participate in bigger processes. My second observation relates to the purposes of networking. From the narratives we heard this morning and this afternoon, it is clear that networking happens for a reason. In particular instances, as we saw in the presentation of Lokmanj, it could take the shape of access to food, to health, or entitlements, as was said, or more generally, as in the case of Ignatian Solidarity Network, social justice. We engage in networking for an apostolic purpose. And I would say before two days ago, I would have said that we engage in networking in order to make a difference in the world, especially in those instances where human dignity is undermined or distorted, such as in situations of conflict, displacement, oppression, denials of rights, and failure to protect our common home. But I believe that Greg Boyle offered a more persuasive account when he said, we're in this so that we can be reached by people, so that the people can make a difference. So these situations of degradation present opportunities for networking because they challenge us to join purposes and processes with other people who seek to make a difference and who seek to transform our world. My third observation, if the desire to expand our vision and scope beyond the limitations of our situation is important to networking, so is the capacity for imagination. 
And listening to the narratives this morning and this afternoon, it is the exercise of the imagination that allows us the opportunity and gives us the capacity, the ability to see the world as God sees it. That is to hold everything together, to see the joy, but also the pain, the despair, but also the hope, to see the challenges, but also the possibilities, to see the wounds as well as the tenderness. Imagination in this context is not fantasy. It's about seeing the concreteness of the human reality and engaging with it and envisaging alternatives. As collaborators and partners in mission, if in our processes and enterprises of networking, we couldn't imagine a world that is different from what we are faced with, then our initiatives will be delusional and futile. The reason why RIPAM, JPIC, GCCM, G and Lockman, ICE, ICE, N, and others do what they do is a compelling vision of the possibility of a different world. So by the grace of imagination, we know that the world we see could be other than the way we and others experience it, especially in its most painful and dehumanizing aspects. From the perspective of social apostolate then, our efforts at networking serve no meaningful purpose if we couldn't imagine the possibility of a more just, peaceful, healed, and reconciled world. My fourth observation, although, as has been said, networking connects our strengths, realistically, I believe we best participate in it with an attitude of humility, perhaps even woundedness, to recall the wisdom of Greg Boyle. And I think this is a real challenge, especially for Jesuits. Alone and by ourselves, we cannot change the world. To recall the wise words of Father Adolfo Nicolás, which Roberto quoted this morning, the mission of the Society of Jesus is big and global. Jesuits are small. And so how do we fulfill our mission effectively, if not in connection with and in interdependence with others? How do we become women and men for others if we are not humble enough to be women and men with others and behind others? I think this is the key challenge of networking for everything we do, especially in the social apostolate. We will not always be in pole position because we are still small relatively and our reach is equally small. We connect with others in order to expand our apostolic scope of influence and to do so as co-workers, co-laborers who don't always expect to retain leadership positions. To imagine ourselves as this minimal society is both a challenge and an opportunity. To realize that whatever we can achieve, we almost always have to do it by collaborating, playing subsidiary, supporting roles in networking initiatives such as we have been introduced to today. And so, my fifth observation, as I understand it, collaboration is the hard currency of networking. Again, to paraphrase another Jesuit superior general, a serving Jesuit superior general, Arturo Sosa, 
Collaboration confers on all of us, without exception, the status of subjects. Collaboration confers on all of us the status of subjects. In other words, we are collaborators. We are not simply permitting others to join us. No, we are engaging with others, as we heard from Lockmanch. And so there's a quality of mutuality here, a quality of mutuality, the realization that we are all in this together equally. Whatever Jesuits have achieved across the centuries, they have been at their best when they've been collaborating with partners, bless you, and with others. And as we say where I come from, if you want to walk, if you want to go fast, then you walk alone. But if you want to go far, walk with others. My sixth observation. There is another challenge that I believe comes out of the narratives of networking we have heard today. Sometimes when we think networking, we think structure, we think institution, we think parts that fit together. We almost build rigidity into our thinking. That this part fits here and that part fits there. And once we have all the parts, we can say we have a network. And we have heard it from Pope Francis today and two years ago in this very hall that that kind of thinking is simply occupying space. And that the moment you do that, you lose even the sense of networking because networking thrives on flexibility. It is spirit and mission driven. Spirit and mission driven. How we engage in networking is highly dependent on and influenced by the changing context of our mission. And as Chris put it, context provides purpose and purpose keeps people working together. Initiatives of networking remain open to change and transformation because the situations in which such networking operates are constantly evolving. Flexibility and creativity in our strategies of networking are critical for the sustainability of the process of networking itself. Finally, if there's an important critical lesson that I take from the narratives of the experiences of networking, it is this, that there is a difference a difference between networking in a digital sense and networking in an apostolic sense. The first represents in personal processes, highly intelligent, no doubt, but like Pavlov's dog, they are artificial and couldn't tell you that their father was poor but an honest man. For us, Networking must mean more than the parts that fit together. Machines that work or ideas that are compatible. I believe in our social apostolate, networking is really about how we are connected, with whom we are connected, and for whom we are connected, how we are connected, with whom we are connected, and for whom we are connected. It is who we are and what we can do as individuals and communities that really matter. And so I believe that networking is really a function of the quality, the quality of our relationships. With a proverb in Eastern Africa, we say mountains don't meet what people do. We can create all the structures and processes of networking, but in the final analysis, those structures and processes would amount to little more than a self-serving exercise unless they enable us to enter 
into the experience of profound solidarity with and radical witnessing to the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the peoples of our times, especially those who are afflicted or excluded in any way. As I see it, therefore, networking is a process whose purpose is apostolic. We are networking to connect our strengths in order to place ourselves at the service of the least and most vulnerable peoples and communities or what Yon Sobrino calls the crucified people. And I would say, let's not forget that and let's not forget them. Thank you. Bien, muchísimas gracias. Eh, creemos que aquí en este panel se han arrojado unos insumos que realmente empiezan a darle mucho más cuerpo y sentido a la manera de cómo podemos materializar todo lo que es nuestro trabajo en red, en las acciones sociales. Lo que presentó Krish, la reflexión tuya, Valeria, nos deja indicios de que sí es posible. La cosa es cómo vamos a empezar a materializar esto de manera real y concreta en nuestros diferentes centros sociales. Muchísimas gracias a todas y a todos por su intervención. Este es un aviso parroquial. Eh, resulta ser que eh, nosotras las mujeres que estamos en este recinto, nos vamos a ausentar en la sesión quinta a las 17.15 porque tenemos una cita con el Padre General, porque vamos a tomarle la palabra, por decirlo de alguna manera, y es que él en sus diferentes exposiciones por estos días nos animó diciéndonos que las mujeres somos una prioridad para la compañía y que no lo dijo, tengo grabaciones por allí donde lo hice y mis compañeras también lo escucharon. Entonces, la idea es que queremos conversar con él, queremos presentarnos, queremos ponernos a su disposición para que él sepa que hay un grupo de mujeres de todos los continentes que estamos dispuestas a aportar, no a criticar, sino a aportar en cómo podemos hacer crecer eh, la inclusión y la justicia de la mujer, no solamente en el marco de la compañía de la mujer, de la de compañía de Jesús, sino también de la iglesia. Así que las compañeras que están coordinando grupos en esos espacios, le vamos a pedir la solidaridad de los caballeros para que tengan la amabilidad de reemplazarlas mientras estamos en esa reunión. ¿Contamos con ustedes, señores? Bueno. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, María Carmen.